Life is always benevolent if we quit imposing our ideas on it. Awareness, the final frontier. These are the explorations of Jonathan Robinson and Brian Tom O'Connor. Their continuing mission, to discover fresh new paths to the mystery within. To seek out new joys and new methods of awakening. To boldly go into the heart of expanded consciousness. This is Awareness Explorers. Welcome back, fellow explorers. It's great to have you back on Awareness Explorers. I'm Jonathan Robinson. I'm with my trusty co-host. Brian Tom O'Connor. And we have a guest explorer, somebody whose book I actually read. And, you know, I don't read a lot. So if I read an entire book, that book has got to be really good. And it's Lisa Carrillo. And let me tell you a little bit about Lisa. You know, I know her because she took the finder's course and she does stuff with a certain technique I like. Uh, and then I just started to notice that this woman puts out a really good vibration and started to look into her stuff. So this is uh, what her official bio is. And it said, Lisa had a sudden shift into peace in 2009 during a silent retreat. She saw her previous identity as a mere collection of thoughts. And when those thoughts returned, she questioned them using various techniques dissolving the ideas of a vulnerable separate self and returning to a stable experience of the one benevolent flow. She has been influenced by teachers like Adyashanti, Byron Katie, A.H. Almas, Leonard Jacobson, Isaac Shapiro, and Gangaji. She is the author of Living Awake, 20 Techniques to End, I Got It, I Lost It. Welcome to Awareness Explorers, Lisa. It's great to be with you both. So um, I'll let you have the first question, Brian. You also read her book, and I'm wondering what uh, stood out for you. Well, I thought I would be interested in starting with hearing about that retreat that you talked about. I, I believe in your book, you said it was a silent retreat with Adyashanti, and, and you said halfway through the retreat, I realized that I was wasting the retreat by focusing on something in the future. So I let go of all goals and just enjoyed following the schedule and resting as simple awareness. And that so resonated with me uh, because when I sit down and think I'm going to get somewhere in the future, that's not, that's not what brings about the joy of pure being. So I, I, wanted, I was wondering if you'd be interested in expanding and filling us in a little bit about that. Sure. Uh, what is happening right now is if you want to think you can get close to the future, this is the closest you can get because this is real and happening. What's in our head is not, and it's not connected to the future at all. Um, and I had already had a practice where I was focused on sensations moment by moment without judging where they were going, if they were positive or negative, and noticing that we actually enjoy ups and downs. We enjoy undulations. All of what happens can be pleasurable if we enjoy it instead of judge it and place expectations on it. So I switched. I went back into that mode for the retreat. I love that idea. Um, you know, I've started doing a kind of a lot of sensation stuff and trying to not judge them, which of course. I am very good at doing, and you're right that, you know, to, to some extent, like if I'm feeling angry, I want to feel angry in that moment. You know, there's like, I got some juice. I feel self-righteous, that poor, whatever, you know, and, and to like, you know, let it pass through. And I'm wondering if you still do that practice and if you do it through daily life or is it more of a meditation? Um, I definitely feel like whatever is happening to me is my practice. Like I, I enjoy meditating. It's something I do regularly, but life is my primary practice. Mm -hmm. And yes, you know, with any sensation, like I was feeling my heart was feeling more closed um, when I was worried about our home and some repairs that need to happen. And when I was, noticing those sensations 
there was this actual movement to want to change my attitude. Now, not always does that happen. In this case, it did. But that particular sensation came with a sense that it's tightness, then relaxes. It just seemed like that's what happens when you're tight, then you relax. And the more I focus on the tightening, the more it just wanted to relax, not out of the thing, forcing it. So sometimes that's how sensations go. And then sometimes exactly like you say, I'm angry and I can feel the part of me that wants that rush. And I just surrender to that rush and see where is it going to go. And, you know, you also have a technique in your book, which was kind of like, look for the part of you that wants the situation to be as it is. And I really like that technique, you know, like if, if I'm on a call, I'm having trouble. There's a part that, you know, thinks that this jerk is being difficult or whatever. And the part that's self-righteous, but there is a part that is kind of enjoying this situation and wants to be, it to be exactly as it is. And if I can get in touch with that part, it really changes the whole attitude and allows more peaceful awareness to appear. Yes. Yeah. Heard it best that way. That was brilliant. Oh, thank you. And it's it's both sides. The part that wants to be self righteous. I noticed that part. Wow. You know, you want to feel like you're a separate person. You have the freedom to have that experience right now. And then, oh, you want to have a challenge, and you want to see what happens when two people go in different ways, and where does that go? You know. So both sides. The part that's more into the adventure and the part that's more into separation they both they both have complete validity and and what you're doing is really letting go of all resistance to all of it right because i've noticed that there is just a natural movement that moves into harmony it just happens i don't have to make it happen just the more i notice the more that seems to just catalyze that process and of course, we are drawn towards harmony. So I have a question actually for both Brian and you. Something I noticed about your book was that it really dealt with a lot of psychology, mm -hmm. a lot of changing your interpretations of things. And you interwove it with awareness and how the two can kind of work together in a certain way. And the reason why I say it's a question for both you and Brian is that Brian and I had this ongoing discussion about, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a little bit more into self-help than he is and more of the psychology and he's more into the purity of awareness. And it seems like you have, you in your book really made them fit and in your life really made them fit together very well. I'm wondering what that process was and if you can please convince Brian of the superiority of my ideas in this case. Can I jump in there before beforehand, since this was addressed to both both of us? This is uncanny, Jonathan, because this was exactly my next question that I have in my notes, because Jonathan and I have this. We talk about the two wing analogy and, uh, you know, with one wing being psychological improvement and one wing being experiencing our true nature is pure universal awareness. And I tend to weigh in on one and he tends to weigh in on another. But you seem to have found a synthesis in your book, a beautiful synthesis where psychological improvement seems to bring about self-realization. In other words, breaking through the illusion of the separate self. Yes. So uh, most use of psychology, at least in its earlier days, I don't know, it may be changing, um, has been a justification for how I am and how do I get more of what I want. And both of those things, of course, just build on the smaller self. Mm -hmm. Once we know that we are the infinite, that we are the absolute and unharmable, then when the conditioning arises, what do we do with that? And psychology has a lot of tools of understanding. And if you're understanding, not because you want to believe in it or fortify it, but if you're understanding because you want to open it up, and it's like, you know, a necklace that's all knotted up. When you start to pull out the knots, 
you don't have to necessarily unwind everything. Just once you start to loosen it, it can just kind of fall open. So that's what more how I see psychology working. Hallelujah, mm-hmm. sister. <laughs> but you talk about the illusion of the separate identity. And so I just want to dive into that a little more because it seems central to your book. You call it our thought-based identity. And so what is the separate self? Why is it an illusion? In other words, we do seem to have a body that does seem to be separate. So could you sort of expand upon that for our listeners? Yes. So um, when we really just sense being and the perceiving that emanates from being, then our body is just one more vehicle of perceiving of sensations coming in. That's it. It's just a sensation. And But the being is, of course, beyond that, as you both know very well. Our, set, our separate sense of self is this whole con- concept we have, our personality, how we want to be perceived, what we think we want, what we think our future should be, what we think our rights are. All of these actually form a box. And it's not very fluid compared to the dynamism of our natural being. Mm-hmm. And it's what gets offended. It's what gets disappointed. It's what gets afraid. All of those things. And it seems like a lot of your methods were kind of looking at the underlying beliefs or assumptions of this separate self and kind of, as you just uh, just said, loosening the knot. And when that knot is loosened, true beingness is allowed to shine forth more obviously. Is that correct? Yes, yes. So like two things from my book, when I was little, when that I really felt that separate self come in was when my parents made a choice and I thought there was another choice. You know, they wanted me to stay in the living room. I thought I should go to my friend's bedroom. And in that moment, I decided, wow, I have to look out for myself. And that began all the strategies to get Lisa what she wants. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, the we can actually have an experience that isn't tied to those narrow expectations. We can have a more fluid, oh, so this is what comes next. Oh, so this is what comes next. And even our choices arise in us. You know, you can't make yourself make a decision. Mm-hmm. It comes when it comes because this is what comes next. And when we're in that position, it's not even a position anymore. It's it's so integrated with what is coming next in every everything around us. Mm-hmm. So our bodies are, are not anything. Our personality is just a bunch of thoughts. You know, our bodies are just one more thing in this big world. There's no line between our bodies and something else until we put it there with our thoughts. So all of the patterns and strategies that we have to get what we want and avoid what we don't want and all our habits and all our opinions about what should happen, this is what really the thought-based personality or the thought-based identity is. And when that gets dropped or at least sort of ignored, then all the barriers that we divide reality with start to fall away. Is that kind of the idea? And then we see <laughs> the totality? Right, exactly. With, without the thoughts, without believing the thoughts, there's just no boundary. You know, you can imagine when a child first sees, they just see a blur of colors and they don't know what's in front of something else. They don't know what's, and we teach them how to separate everything. Mm -hmm. You know, focusing on thoughts and our interpretations and such, it made uh, made me realize you've been influenced a lot by Byron Katie, uh, which of course is, we had her on the podcast and she's amazing, but her method is very um, simple. And I found that if I did it, it got a little bit repetitive because it was so, you know, it's four simple questions for every situation. I liked how you kind of had slightly different questions for different situations that 
made it so it wasn't mechanical. You really had to think about the answer of each of these questions. And as I explored them, there was a sense of, of the hardness of the thought or the naughtiness of the thought would start to dissipate. And I'm wondering if you still use these techniques throughout your day. Is it like your day of a bunch of things to do plus, you know, questioning or, or did you eventually get where you're not having to do that very much or it happens automatically? Both. Yeah. It doesn't happen. I don't do it nearly as much, but it's still, I mean, several times a week and it is pretty automatic. Uh Like I had a patient who she didn't come with a full bladder and that was going to impede the quality of her exam. And I found myself kind of withdrawing, thinking I'm not the kind of person who would show up to an exam like that. (laughs) And I could feel that withdrawal. And I was curious, oh, interesting. So you still have an identity that you're the good prepared one. And um, and so I looked at that to see, you know, how does that feel in my body? What does it limit me from experiencing? And um, something with um, even using Byron Katie, but any inquiry, I don't stop when my head comes up with an answer. Mm-hmm. I stop when things change and open in my body and my emotions have a fullness again. It's really key. Yes, really key. Yeah. So, yes. Yeah, so, and, you know, by the end of that, I was really enjoying her. We we're sharing pictures of dogs. <laughs> it was very nice. Can you run us through what the questions or thought process might be in a situation like that so our listeners can better understand? Yeah, sure. So here's the sense I notice. okay, I just pulled away from someone because I have an identity that I'm not like them. So that means I feel safe when I'm responsible in this situation. I feel safe and I'm responsible. So I look to see... Is that true? Is it my responsibility that makes me safe? And what does that belief do inside of me? Mm. And, um, you know, I sure there's been many times I haven't done everything responsibly. And it's worked out. In fact, I can find so many situations where instead I found grace. Somebody took over for me where I failed. Somebody, it was, I mean, over and over, I'm so glad I wasn't responsible. It made me so much more connected. Life is actually about that receptivity, not being just independent. Mm -hmm. And then the, and then noticing that my heart was hardening around that. I I could feel how uncomfortable it was to hold that belief. Mm -hmm. And so I, you know, just gently said, what would it be like? To let, to let that go for a little while. And I could feel that part of me really being tired of holding that. And by providing it the reasons that it didn't have to, I could, you know, it just kind of all came together. Yeah. You know, it really is all held together by the word should. Where in every moment, we kind of have an idea of how it should go. And it often does not go that way. And these concepts definitely going to block us from all these other good things. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And I think we tend to have a particular should that our particular person identifies around. Like mine was that I should be good and, you know, kind, loving, that kind of stuff. And yeah. once I identified that that was the little Lisa's core, mm-hmm. then I started to see how it came up in just any kind of situation. I could get a bill, a notice I'd pay my bill late. And something in me would say, well, if I had been more loving, that wouldn't have happened. Like I could connect anything <laughs> to not being loving enough, right? right? So it was so irrelevant, like a broken record. And one that's one of my favorite techniques is to just be able to see Once we know that we have a particular one, then every time it comes up, you can just say, oh, that's that same one again. Look at that. And it just releases because it's so obviously fake at that point. That's a really interesting concept. Uh, My old teacher used to call it your your, uh, core style or personal style. 
And you're right, like it leaks through everything. You'd be cooking something and see it. You could be talking on the phone. You could be exercising. It's it's always like there. And in, in the landmark form, they have a term called your racket. Yes. You know, your racket that you're always doing, but you don't necessarily know. And when people find out what that is, it's like, how did I not see this? It was all over the place. <laughs> right. Everybody else knows it about you. Exactly, exactly. Usually when I see these things happen, I sometimes say, there goes Brian doing that again. Yeah. <laughs> exactly right. And that sort of like takes me out of identifying with that as as somehow me. Mm -hmm. Right. I had another question, uh, which you touched on in, in your previous question, which is that about safety. Uh, you know, before I before I learned about non-dual awareness and self-inquiry practices, I learned about uh, the Sedona method and they have three questions. Uh, can you let go of wanting control? Can you let go of wanting approval? And can you let go of wanting to be safe? And I could say yes to all the first two and I could never say yes to wanting to be safe. Uh, but you talk about that a, a lot in your book and you say that reality is fundamentally and generously benevolent. But I know there's plenty of people who find that hard to believe. Mm -hmm. How do we how do we feel that directly? Um, so what I am is not my body, right? So my body might not be safe. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I mentioned I was in the hospital in extreme pain, given less than 50% chance of living. And even in extreme pain, there is something that arises that just has the strength for this moment. And then this moment, it's a, it's a miraculous experience to just be absorbed in making it through this moment. So it really doesn't matter what we're experiencing. That core being makes it through and makes it through and makes it through until it leaves this body. So we really are safe. We could be starving. You know, I couldn't eat and lost uh, 40 pounds or something. And lo and behold, I was making it through, making it through, making it through. It, it doesn't matter what is happening. And some of, some of those most intense experiences, you actually get really in touch with that being. There's just nothing else to do but survive. And it is, it is a force. Yeah, yeah. That's a beautiful statement. And I like how you make the distinction. Your body's not safe, but you can't, you can't really destroy awareness. Uh, you know, how can you not be aware? And, and as you tune into it, even if, the body is going through stuff it's just there and and it's it is safe you know you can't you can't burn it right exactly one of your methods was um when you see that you're making a certain assumption to try to assume the opposite mm -hmm. and i'm wondering if you have any stories about that one of my favorite clips from the seinfeld show was uh george is saying that every everything he's ever done in his life hasn't worked out. So Jerry says, well, why don't you just do the opposite? If everything you do is wrong, then the opposite must be right. <laughs> so, and then a, a hysterical scene follows where he asks a woman out and uh, or this woman approaches him and he says, my name's George, I'm unemployed and I live with my parents. Figuring that the opposite of what I would normally do, and it ends up that it works for him. But you know, we we tend to hold on to our assumptions, and I like this idea that you would just totally assume the opposite and see what that does as a way of loosening that tightness and how it can then open up new possibilities. Do you have a story like that? Uh, well, you know, when I was thinking I wanted to live in this house and this house there's kind of a miracle the way we got it and I've never had a place where I thought wow this is this is where I want to stay and and then I noticed that 
you know, taking walks around our neighborhood, there was like this little tight part in my gut that was saying, I hope I always live here. I hope I always live here. And it was painful. Yeah. So what if I don't always live here? You know, just I would I would enjoy living somewhere else. You know, is there any part in me that could resonate with that? Well, yes, of course. You know, it's turned out I've lived lots of places and had lots of great experiences. So even if I left in a position where, you know, the situation looked negative, I have seen so often that it just what looks negative turns out to be the best thing. You know, I wanted to get into Georgia Tech. I applied too late. Instead, I ended up at the Institute of Paper, Pulp and Paper Science, which now is part of Georgia Tech, ironically. Um, and boy, their scholarship program was way better. I mean, that was like so good. And somebody broke up with me who I was very, very close to. And I ended up with my current husband. I mean, you can just go on and on that yeah. it's, life has always benevolent if we quit imposing our ideas on it yeah we could make a list of all the times we thought one thing and it proved not to be true or all the times we thought something was good and it ended up being bad and, and eventually you can just say i don't know i have no clue uh, my mind makes up stuff and that relaxation like i don't really believe what these thoughts are because they're so often wrong Right. Really open things up because otherwise we get caught in these loops where we actually believe these thoughts. Mm -hmm. Exactly. One thing in your book that I really identified with um, was when you talked about the bliss trap, because I remember, I remember getting this wonderful, marvelous feeling and I would sit down to meditate to get it back and it, and it would be lousy. And, and then discovering that, Whoa, if I'm totally okay with feeling crappy right now, then it would come back, then it would like flow in. But and 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 use in your techniques, I think it was technique 16, all the facets. You have an example of the bliss trap where you where you sat down expecting joy and lightness, but your practice session felt dull. And I was wondering if you if you might walk us through that a little bit. Oh yeah, sure. So at that point, I was frequently having just this great lightness. And, you know, I just would get so excited about that. But then sometimes this really bad mood would come and I had no idea even where it came from. It's like, I don't, I don't even know where there's a thought in you. There's just this bad mood. And um, fighting it just did not work. So instead, I just sat with, okay, so what does this bad mood actually feel like? And you know, it does turn out that um, excitement and fear feel almost exactly the same in the body. So many feelings, there's a negative and a positive that feel exactly the same in the body. So if we take off the interpretation of a particular emotion, you know, okay, so this feels like it's heavy, it feels like clay, it feels like it doesn't move. And then I'm like, oh my gosh, this feels like being in the depths of the ocean where everything emerges and, you know, the first primordial things might have been born. Well, probably not very deep where there's no sunlight, but, you know, it feels like that right before birth, you know, that or right before conception, that mm -hmm. real, um, you know, surrounded, swathed kind of thing. And, and then it's like, oh, wow. What an awesome experience. And lo and behold, I want that one now. <laughs> Forget about the bliss. <laughs> All right. Um, do you have a question, Brian? Uh, sure, but uh, you, if you do, I'd be happy to let you go. Uh, you go. I, I, I tend to ask too many questions. <laughs> No, no, not at all. But well, you know, I was also very interested in one of my favorite sections of your book was when you talked about the happiness set point. And uh, actually, there was a quote in that section, which you repeated at the end, which I thought, you know, so beautifully summed up your whole book, which was, let's see, the only price of joy is giving up the right to make anything wrong. And that's just, that just says it so beautifully. But you talk about the happiness set point and how how 
we each sort of return to that and how so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit so that we understand what that means and and then also a little bit about how we raise that set point. Yeah. When somebody told me about this, I just didn't believe it that, you know, I don't want to be more happy than whatever is my level. I thought, no, of course, I always want to be happy. That can't be true. But then I started paying closer attention and Yes, you know, when I had a really positive experience, like a big aha moment at a retreat or something, and I got high very shortly thereafter, like within a day, I would suddenly be in a bad mood. I'd be making arguments with my partner. It was just weird. So then I was like, okay, well, let's let's behave as though this were true, okay? So this part of me, when I get happy, is going to want to reset. So rather than going with it, how about if I just notice it, notice all that sensation, this this ease coming in, notice the antsiness, notice the irritation. And at that point, I can, first of all, congratulate myself. Wow, I must have raised my happiness set point because now I'm feeling uneasy. Good job, Lisa. You hit the top of the thermostat. Congratulations. Yes, exactly. I could really just be with the sensations and let them flow through. And I can play with them, you know, taking a bath or listening to some music. Just let that part have its own evolution, but through a physical process. So with those three things, you know, I can allow that discomfort to resolve without going down with it. So now I get to stay up and eventually this becomes my new happiness set point instead of what it was. You said, um, let that part resolve through a physical process. Can you explain that? Yes. So if I take a bath, then that antsiness gets to have its antsiness without, you know, going into an argument. Instead, it gets to relax into water, you know, or if you watch a movie or read a book, then it carries your body through a whole story and your body does its you know, rise and fall, but you're not invested in, in it. Right, right. You also talked about working with parts that are perhaps hurt or a younger you. And I liked how you kind of went through the whole inner dialogue that you might have with a part that you're trying to, you know, it's, we've all had trauma as a kid in some way. And when it shows up now, how to talk to it in a loving way so that it can, uh, I don't know what you would say, what you're trying to do there, dissolve it, let it know it's love. So it can, so it can what? You know, it seems to have just a natural maturation process where it eventually integrates and once it's integrated into the, you know, the rest of the conditioning, instead of fighting with the rest of the conditioning, then that whole conditioning just becomes, you know, like a blanket, you know, it's just kind of around, but it's not my identity. But when it's up in fight mode, or flight mode, that's when it wants to really just take over. I've been surprised that a lot of our guests uh, who are very awake have mentioned this method. You know, it's not something that's popular in normal culture. People don't talk about it so much that I'm I'm doing parts work with this younger part and this is what I do. And yet for people who are highly awake, it seems like a lot of them stumbled across us at some point because they had to, you know, there was some part fighting and it needed love and this is how we uh, dealt with it or how they dealt with it so um it's interesting that you're you're another guest who who has really gotten into that um do you still use that or is that something that was more useful soon after your initial awakening all the tools now come in and out but there was definitely a period when that was a big focus Mm -hmm. Uh, and Yes, it it feels like, well, the reason it just was so natural, you know, when that clear scene happened and there was just no separate Lisa, there was just, it was so obvious 
that there is nothing that doesn't belong mm. because it's all one thing. There is nothing that doesn't belong. You can look at any politician and that's a great one. If there's any politician that irritates me, I know, oh, so there's a part of me who wants to say, I'm not like that. That's great exploration. Doesn't care, matter what side of the colors you are. <laughs> I have a, a, a picture of one of those politicians, I won't mention their name, on my altar next to the Dalai Lama. And I, I, I take my spiritual thermometer every day by seeing how open I feel to the Dalai Lama and how closed I feel to the other guy. <laughs> That's beautiful. Yes, it's beautiful and brave. <laughs> and humbling. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> yes, yes. I definitely feel myself and in, in everyone, you know, we can, there's been parts of me who was scared and felt like there was just nothing to do but just defend myself or fix that other person, go against something. And um, boy, you know, it's, it, that's such a scared place to be. And, and so not only is there compassion for them, but I also feel that there is an aliveness in me that wanted to get past that. And mm -hmm. I know that same aliveness is in them. So I have every confidence that this is, this is good. Mm -hmm. And in fact, at this moment, you know, there is also the knowing at this moment, this perfect balance needs them to be exactly like that. Yeah, yeah. I have a term, uh, they're playing, they're, they are a perfect them. They are playing that part really well. Yes, <laughs> yes, I'm so grateful, so yeah. grateful. You know, it's way more fun to be, you know, in the saintly part or whatever. So, you know, for the moment, they have to be in that part. And I don't like it when I find myself in that part. So, golly, you know, <laughs> I feel grateful I don't have to be that part at this moment. Yeah, we needed somebody to play that part and 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 bravely you you chose that one exactly but speaking it, it, of fun uh, it seems like you've discovered that that in, instead of transcending life life in all its ups and downs becomes more fun when you are less identified with that thought-based identity that is so true it is all fun because there is a part of me that wants all of it. And having found that, you know, it is, it's so, um, you know, every time we let go of a part, let go of any tightness, there's this new, wow. Mm. You know, so if we get to find a new tightness, that's what we get to do. And if we are staying in a tightness, we get to feel what it's like to be solid and, you know, the hard and, and that is an amazing miracle. You know, the, once we've tasted, as you guys have this, everything that's infinite and indestructible, that it would want to be hard and separate, you know, you know how big and alive it has to be to think that that's interesting. Yeah, yeah. Well, even God wants variety. <laughs> Apparently, exactly, exactly. Is there anything that we haven't asked you or Brian that you haven't asked that might be uh, something we've overlooked or something that you might want to add? Um, you know, I love the way you both have highlighted that theme that something in us wants this moment. And it that that can be such a big leap to get to that because sometimes the moment, you know, we just feel scared and hurt. And so the the baby step is I love you. So the resistance to being afraid, the resistance to being angry, that, that is what becomes the chains. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the baby step is just to abandon ourselves into fear, abandon ourselves into loneliness with the knowledge 
that we can't let go too much. We never can let go too much. You can just let go more and more and more. And in the end, we discover that what we are is still there when we let go all of it. So like one time when I was just, uh, I had this core sense of need and attachment. You know, I had the um, avoidant attachment stuff. Mm -hmm. It was amazing how much there was this push and pull. And I finally just let myself be completely lonely and abandoned and longing for love. And I found once I was just totally open to that, the question just kind of came in. So how do you even know what love feels like if you're so unloved? And so I went to find, you know, this could not be a mental thing. I had to go and find where in me knows what love is. I kept looking, what knows love? And then I popped out into, I am love. Like I found this part and this part is love. It's not knowing love, it is love. And loneliness was gone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I like we, uh, um letting go is so important. Something Ajashanti said that I really liked was, he said, letting go is a devotional act. Mm -hmm. I love that term. And he said, basically, if you could just let go of your resistance to whatever is happening, you would wake up immediately. So sometimes I've used the mantra, what am I resisting now? You know, sometimes it's pretty obvious. You, know, you, don't have to, there's, you don't have to search for the answer to that question. And sometimes it's less obvious, you know, like uh, I might be resisting looking a little stupid or I might resist looking incompetent, for example. And, you know, if I can let go of that, though the feeling of freedom, psychological freedom is greater. And then it seems that, that I'm not something that then I can more notice the piece that's always in the background. And some of your tools really, I think are very ingenious at unnodding people and seeing what we're resisting. Thank you. Yes, yeah, I, you guys just really get the theme. <laughs> Clearly, it's definitely the choir here. <laughs> Well, we all, as Ramda said, walking each other home, and it's good to be in an echo. There's certain echo chambers you don't want to be in, but uh, the consciousness echo chamber is, is necessary because we're all subject to a lot of, of uh, other messages. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, the first time I let go was actually at Landmark. And mm -hmm. I had set up boundaries with my mom because I thought she was having expectations of me, blah, blah. And they said, your mom loves you. You're the one withdrawing from her. Uh -huh. And that just floored me. I was like, there's just no way I could find that perspective. But I knew I was here to try on what they said. So I just looked and looked where and how could that be? And, you know, so often we're just so sure of ourselves. Yeah. But if somebody paid us a million dollars, we could find another perspective. <laughs> <laughs> I now believe that, yes. <laughs> yes, yes. And it's that level of, I have to find it, you know, that, that just is so, yes. Then I was able to see, wow, my mom has always been motivated by love for me. Mm regardless of what she says or does that has been her underlying motivation and boy you know that was just so freeing and um it was also really humbling yeah. but once you do a big let go like that you know you can decide you know maybe the next let go is worth it too and the next one and the next one yeah and then you have a lot of uh freed up energy for for new explorations and new discoveries and new peace and new love. Yes. Oh, that's you know, we only have a hundred units of energy. If they're all going into hating your mother, then there's no energy for other stuff. Right. That's great. That's great. Um, any last thoughts, uh, Brian, before we go into meditation? 
Well, I just love what you just said, and and it, it occurred to me that um, that when we give up the energy that we're wasting on uh, on resisting everything, we find that there's actually much more unlimited source of energy behind it all. Mm -hmm. Yeah. With those words of wisdom, we hear that you have a guided meditation. And I, I do uh, recommend to people that you check out your book, Living Awake. And uh, also your website is experiencingthetrueself.com, where you can find out all kinds of stuff about Lisa and her work and her coaching and other stuff. Yeah, and a video course they now have. Video course? You're, you're starting to get out there more and more. What's that like? <laughs> You know, it's it's so funny. I'm doing it for the pure joy of it. Really, yeah. I just love each step. I end up working with a web designer in Nigeria, and I get to see his computer screen and what his YouTube shows him. And, you know, yeah. it's, it's so fascinating to step into this other world I don't usually get to experience. Yeah, that's great that you're using your life experience in that way to you know, bring you more uh, awakening and new experiences too. That's great. So I'm looking forward to hearing uh, a guided meditation and then we'll chat for a little bit more after you bring us back. Thanks. So we can just notice our body sitting here and take some deep breaths. And as we exhale, can relax our eyes and our jaw, our shoulders and our arms and hands. Just let any tension or holding or constrictions drain down, down into the earth. And continuing following our breath, do the same. Noticing our torso, our pelvis, our legs, our feet. And just let any holding release into the earth. We can notice our thoughts, notice our emotions, and then feel into the aliveness that answers, what am I? Just feel that beingness. And as you feel that beingness, notice how it's there regardless of what we do or think. Notice how it can perceive where our ear is without seeing it, our right ear, our left big toe, our left elbow. Notice how this beingness has no problem. Notice how this beingness is now. Notice how this beingness doesn't stop at the edge of our skin. It doesn't have an exact boundary or limit. It's more of a movement than a thing, in fact. Enjoy. Ah. 
how effortless it continues. Feel its newness, its agelessness. How unperturbed it is. Sensations come and go in the body. Thoughts come and go in this beingness. Outlasts all of it. It's not distant from all of it. It's intimate, inherent within all of it. As we rest as this being, as this movement, See, it never leaves, never stops. It's potent, it's gentle. Feel its essence of knowing, its dynamism. It has no beginning, it has no end. And as we go through our day, we know It's unchanged as it flows in every experience. So enjoying this being. We can open our eyes being here. And everything is not outside of it. Everything is included. Beautiful. Thank you so much. Wow. Thank you. I liked how uh, you you almost use almost like a repeating mantra. Notice how, you know, notice how this is going on. Notice your thoughts floating through. Notice, and really, that could be a technique in of itself. Notice how your your personal style or the thing that you always do is manifesting now. And notice how you're resisting something. And notice how you can open to deeper relaxation and, and that can be a great 
little meditation in of itself. Yeah, really. Well, I notice how I'm very appreciative right now of uh, how you've managed to integrate making your life more of a meditation and not creating these artificial separations that we can do between spirituality and our lives. And, and that's really important, you know, if we're going to progress on the path and, and fully enjoy all the gifts of being human. Yes, I feel like it's possible to get to that point of knowing that there's the observer, but mm -hmm. that's not the end. You know, there is that which erupts and expresses as this. And once we're on that ride, you know, it's play, all of it. And for the people who aren't seeing you on YouTube or on Zoom, you emanate a, a lot of joy, and uh, it's, it's definitely a transmission I can feel, and, and I really appreciate that about you. Thank you. Me too. And um, if you like this stuff, tell your friends, family, and feel free to support us at patreon.com forward slash awareness explorers. We often send extra guided meditations or blogs or conversations we have with our guests and we really appreciate your support and we loved uh i always learn so much from our guests and and as i said lisa's book really rocks it so uh you might consider getting that living awake the 20 techniques to end i got it i lost it uh which is my my mantra normally i got it no i lost it <laughs> <laughs> anyways uh, thank you and till next time friends keep exploring keep exploring keep exploring thank you for listening to Awareness Explorers to learn more you can check out our website at awarenessexplorers.com please subscribe to our podcast on your favorite podcast app we'd love it if you would post a review and please share our link on Facebook and with family and friends, because knowing yourself as awareness is the greatest gift you can give yourself or someone you love.